welcome back, uh, Sword and Musketeers. Slightly different video, we're going to start today. A uh, little job that has to be done on a Snyder Enfield freeband rifle. It's a, a really nice example. What's unusual for me, although I've handled a lot of Mark III carbines, I've never actually seen a Mark III three band rifle but that is what this is marked up as being um now the the story is that uh, i'm selling this to somebody else i'm not prepared to let it go with the damage that i have spotted so the buyer and the seller are contributing to having the repair done which in my opinion will seal the accuracy as far as this rifle is capable of. Um, I have shot both the five groove sergeant rifles, the carbines and the free bands. Um, and yes, they are a bit of a handful. It's a thumping great bullet. So you want everything you can on your side to help you with accuracy. Uh, let's just have a quick look at the rifle and I'll point out to you I see the problem as. So here we are, lovely, lovely condition, outwardly, uh, three band, Snyder Enfield. Now, the lock is marked up as Victoria, obviously, VR, and 1869 Enfield. So, all good. Roller over. Let's look at the breech. Now, three. Without a doubt, a three. Nothing's been added or ground off or taken away. The usual sort of battered looking lock, because they had a lot of problems getting cartridges out of these weapons in use. Um, there we are, there are two roundels. No, in fact, there are three roundels. That's nice. First time I've noticed that. Sometimes you see things through the camera, which you don't see with the bare, worn out Mark I eyeball. So we've got three cartouches on there. I'll have a look at that later and see if I can match that third one up closest to the butt plate with anything I conventionally understand. But there's the uh, Enfield WD Mark I stamp or first model. Now, if we turn it over and have a look at some of the identifying marks on the other side, um, there's the two nice fixing screws, both marked with the WD arrow, or otherwise known crow's foot. Now, this is the, this tells the story of the rifle. Uh, if, you, if you wanted to, you could look up all of those marks. But here's the important bit, steel. So what we have is a steel barrel. That means it is a Mark III. And I think worth doing the work on. Uh, we have a serial number 8794. It's in nice condition. Ejection still quite good. Right, now, the tricky thing is, what is the problem? Well, turns out, and I don't blame this on the last owner because he cares for his, his guns, this muzzle. Now, I get the camera to focus on the thing. It's been dropped and it has lost its perfect squareness. 
I checked this square just now. And there is a problem. The muzzles are not meant to be flared. And if you imagine dropping a piece of copper pipe, soft copper pipe on the floor from a height, that's what's happened to this. Now, a gentleman that owns it was recently visited by undesirables and in the classic way of Great Britain these days, because the police thought he might be so bold as to defend himself, they took all his weapons away. And you can see the upward curve there on the top of the muzzle. Anyway, uh, they took all his weapons away for his own protection, inverted commas, so he doesn't shoot anybody and, you know, lo and behold, protect himself. Anyway, in their ardour to protect the criminal, they've damaged the gun. They've dropped it and dented it, dented the end of the barrel, the muzzle. So when the bullet comes out, you're either going to get an uneven gas escape problem or the last thing that the bullet touches as it leaves the muzzle is going to be uneven. So it's my job to restore that. And that is going to mean very carefully stripping the rifle down. Let's see if we can get some focus. Getting that in the lathe and recrowning it, turning out the damage and recrowning it. So when the bullet leaves that muzzle, it leaves evenly. And it's got half a chance of arriving on target. Because this rifle is going to be exported, I don't want to send it all the way to wherever it's going and have the poor fellow, who happens to be a good customer, uh, complain that it throws bullets through the target sideways because these are big bullets to go through the target sideways or even that they don't arrive on the target. So that's the job. So I'm going to follow through with this and you can watch how I tackle it. And I'm not recommending that it is in any way casebook study. I'm just showing you the way I would do it. So, immediately after taking off the lock and the barrel, this is what we have. Look at the condition of that. That is wonderful. I'm going to decock it in a moment, take the tension off the spring, but just look at the condition, the sear, the rocker, that spring, the clear the clarity of the marks. You can check every single one of those E10 Enfield inspector marks. There's an E10, an E11. Something with a three on the back, 13 possibly. Anyway, just an appreciation of a bit of fantastic Victorian engineering. If we have a quick look at the barrel, turn it over, further marks and investigations. There's a registration mark on the hut. I wouldn't say that's 100% in line, but uh, dims the brakes. The rest of the markings on the shoe of the breech, another registration mark. Now, that looks like steel. So, 
beautiful clear markings. Let's just see what this one looks like this one. Because to me, that looks like a date. That looks like 669. 60. But if I read it the other way up, of course, it could be. Oh, nine, nine. Any road up. There we go. A bit of a battering that's received at some stage there. Right, next stage. How do you loosen a barrel that's been on a rifle for such a long time? Well, gently is the, the first thing to think about. I personally like to use good old diesel oil because it's a seeker. So it should go in and find its way. If I put some diesel oil on here, it should go in and find its way around the thread. Touch on the outside. Let's see what happens. Gonna damage it in any way, so I apply it to all the visible seams. And usually leave that for a few days actually, if I can. I'll leave it for a few days before molesting it any further because we don't want to force it. Taking all the parts off which might be damaged in the turning process within the lathe. That doesn't want to go either. Sometimes the smallest screws are the most difficult to get out. It's really, it's a matter of getting the correct screw turner upon it. Put the wrong one on and you just bubber up the head.
So now diesel's in there. We'll try a little bit of heat. See if we can crack the seal. And get it to part company. There's a possibility that just attacking it now might work, but let's not be lazy. But applying the heat, have to be careful that we don't change the colour. So. <laughs> Difference. I've changed the jaws to aluminium. Aluminium, yum, yum. Okay, yeah, we got bubbling around the thread. I don't know if you can see. There is a bubbling of oil and gunk coming out. That's a good sign. It's pretty smelly as well. Okay, so here we go, here we go, here we go. All right, gotta get in there fairly quickly. surface so we'll put a bit of brass in there tighten it up as quickly as possible not ideal no she's moving so we're gonna have to try the thumping method And there it goes. What a beauty. Close up again, nothing worse than a loose spanner. Why are we doing this on a regular basis? I would make a spanner to fit. Okay, we're good there. Avoid the temptation of grabbing it with my bare hands in my excitement, because I've done that before. And off she comes. What a cutie. So, there we go. No damage at all. Pretty smelly though. It's giving off a, a horrible smell. All right, we'll be able to clean that up. Pay attention to it. A little bit later on. A little bit of gunk in there. Love picking out gunk. Must have always been a picker when I was a child. There we go. 
centuries of gunk, unburnt powder, and other such yucky muck. Have a look at the thread. There we go. So, we now have the barrel ready. These aluminium marks will come off. It's not really worth fussing about them at the moment, but there's no actual barrel damage there. And also, it's very tempting to let this sight block run up against the side of the jaw but you mustn't do that because they are only soldered on and you'll knock that off in a moment, especially if the heat has transferred into the barrel. It's touchable. All right, I can see inside the breech a little bit clearer. It's a bit rusty, so we might run a, a brush, wire brush on the drill in there later on. Right, now let's look at the lathe. So what I want to do is because I want to hold the work right up at the front so I've got the most steady grip, I don't want to leave this end wangling around in the lathe because it will pass through the headstock. So what I do is I usually, I've got a number of these and I make them up for each job. And they're like a bush that it will slide up the barrel and it will hold the thing parallel and straight. Also, it means I won't have to apply such a heavy grip through the jaws to stop it flying around. And we could, the ill effects of it flying around all over the place could be an uneven muzzle cut or crowning uh, or you could even bend the barrel, possibly. I can see that happening. So the next job is to make up a new bush. That one's made of lignum, um, probably out of this stuff, um, to fit to the barrel, to slide up as far as we can go, to hold it parallel. Onwards. So here we are. Here's the uh, billet of nylon I'm gonna use. This is the tail end of the stock, which is a pretty useful feature, but you can see it's too big. So part one, make it big enough to fit in there. So here we are, one freshly made bush for the lathe, a bit tight over the sights, but we don't want to give away, well it was tight. Uh, anyway, runs all the way down to there which should put it just before the mouth coming out on the outside, which will support the barrel all the way through. So let's pop it in there. So here we are, there's the bush in the back of the lathe. Got the barrel nice and solid. If we just revolve this now at a slow speed, you can actually see the damage. That has got to be addressed. Here we go then. see how flared this muzzle is for a start. So I'm going to start on the outside.
still jumping. Going a bit further. It's really almost cosmetic. Here we're getting full cut down here it's not even touching yet so we're not flat yet Just here is not cutting yet. It's only a tiny amount. That will throw the bullet. Okay, so we get a nice cut there. And back went to the crown. Now let's do the inside. Fiddle around a bit more with the outside.
So here we are, back off the lathe, bush removed to be stored for the next job. Uh, how can I? You can still see the rifling running out right till the end. And more importantly, it is now flat. Job's good enough. Right, just a bit of colouring to do. So here we are, I've given the barrel a superficial clean, I've given the chamber a scrub out with wire brushes, etc. Uh, it's actually time to start putting it back together. And so here we are, I've given the barrel a superficial clean, I've given the chamber a scrub out with wire brushes, etc. Uh, it's actually time to start putting it back together. And so there's the register mark, just a click or so out. So spanner's done up as tight as it can be. Got a nice bit of brass to protect the action. We need a sharp crack from a hammer. And there we are. Perfect, that is perfect. Boom, 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 boom. Eight, seven, nine, four. All matching. Ding. So, here we are, finished job, all back together, greased, cleaned, um, but most importantly, what have we got with this little square now? So, no daylight, no daylight there. the same yeah all goes up nice and square muzzle is now square crown is finished jobs are good one